So I'm going to start off this morning with some uh, aquifactors and some examples of uh, uh, adventures with the syndesmosis. Uh, and so I thought I'll start off with a uh, relatively straightforward case. And this is, uh, let's just say he's a 25 year old gentleman who presents to our emergency room. This is a closed injury. Uh, and as you can see, it's an ankle fracture dislocation, uh, which appears to have a fibular fracture uh, and probably some injury on the medial side. Uh, just, uh, just to make a quick comment on this, I'm sure there, during all of our training, we were told that this x-ray should never have been taken. But apparently at my institution, this x-ray is taken every single day. So here you go, a dislocated ankle in x-ray. Uh, so obviously most of us would just go ahead and, and try a reduction maneuver down in the emergency room, get this reduced and put in a splint. And so here's how it looks reduced. Uh, at this point in time, it'd be nice if uh, anyone in the audience would like to comment on uh, what they would normally do with this, with this type of injury and how they would approach the uh, uh, the reduction and stabilization of this injury. Uh, if anyone wants to just unmute themselves and chime in, uh, that would be great. Or if they want to make a comment in their, on their screen. Uh, if not, I think I'll just move on, onwards. But this is just a uh, pretty much a straightforward ankle fracture dislocation, uh, fairly comminuted fibula. There is a very small posterior malfracture. Uh, and clearly, based on the injury film, clearly there's an injury to the syndesmosis. And so our goals of treatment here is to reduce the, reduce the ankle, make it stable, right? So that's what we're going to do. And typically, what most surgeons would do is do some type of approach to the fibula, uh, do a direct vision, do a direct reduction under direct visualization. And you can see this is a spiral oblique fracture of the fibula. So this is amenable to... Uh, uh, classic lag screw neutralization plate, uh, stabilization of the, uh, of the fibula. Should we approach that posterior mount? Uh, and then how will we stabilize the syndesmosis? Uh, I think for the most part, most surgeons would probably just, uh, reduce and stabilize the fibula, uh, and somehow reduce the syndesmosis either by closed means using a clamp or by an open means uh, where you would uh, pursue the uh, reduction of the uh, uh and, and, and reduce it open and then stabilize it. So in this case, this is what was done. Uh, simple, once again, lag screw neutralization uh, of the uh, fibular fracture. Uh, with neutralization of the fibula. Uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, we did not go after that posterior mal. Uh, we did an open reduction of the syndesmosis uh, to reduce it. Uh, so at this point in time, we could probably open it up to discussion with the regular, with the faculty as to uh, what they would do and, and uh, how they would approach this. So maybe we could uh, throw it over to Carla or I see a couple of comments here. Yeah, so some of the comments uh, were mentioning that uh, kind of what you sort of did, you know, lateral approach, you know, direct reduction of the fibula and a syndesmotic screw. There was a comment that said that the posterior mal would, uh, was too small to fix. And so I, I asked, you know, and I'm sure we have other cases coming up, but I would pose the question to both you, Carla and Jack, when is a posterior mal too small to fix? Yeah, I, I actually am fairly aggressive with fixing and reducing the posterior mal, uh, simply based on the idea that that posterior mal has the posterior inferior tifid ligament, which is a major stabilizer of the syndesmosis. Uh, we know that the posterior inferior ligament is in fact not injured in pretty much 99% of these injuries. And so reducing the posterior mal actually 
reduces that posterior inferior tibial ligament, uh, creating stability of the syndesmosis. So I tend to go over, go after posterior malus regardless of its size. Uh, many times if it's really tiny like this one, probably not so much, uh, but anything bigger than something that I can reduce and stabilize, I tend to go after regardless of size. And Other thoughts? Jack, Jack yeah. so I'm gonna ask you, sorry, is, is that okay? Um, so when I think about articular injuries that are associated with diaphyseal injuries, which this is, what you've done is fix the diaphysis and assume that that has indirectly helped the joint, the posterior mal, and fix the syndesmosis. What about directly fixing the posterior mal and the syndesmosis and then doing uh, medullary fixation for the fibula? I think that's a, that, that's a, that's a reasonable alternative. Uh, once again, if the posterior mal is a, if it's a posterior mal that's, and I don't know how to find this, but a posterior mal that's actually fixable. This one is, <laughs> Probably borderline not fixable because of its size. Uh, but if 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 it, if I see a poster mal that I know I can address, that I can reduce, and once again, keep in mind that your poster mal reduction is an indirect reduction, right? You're not going to see the joint, so it's an ind indirect reduction of poster mal. But if you can get that poster mal where it's supposed to be, you you got the PITFL attached to the fibula, that will bring your fibula out to length, mm -hmm. and then. In it, then a med and it will also correct the rotation of the fibula because of the attachment of PITFL. So to me, if you if you accomplish that, intramedullary fixation of the fibula would be fine. Uh, my and issue I is, you know, my, uh, to me, to my thinking about this problem, uh, you need to get the fibula correct with it, with respect to length, alignment, and rotation. So you could do that by either directly reducing the fibula or in what you're suggesting is if you reduce and stabilize the post, you indirectly reduce the fibula, mm -hmm. then you could stabilize it with an intramedial device. So it, it, it's two separate questions, right? The mm -hmm. first question is reduction. The sex, second question is stabilization. So when you, propose using an intramedullary device, that's a method of stabilization, but not a method of reduction. Mm -hmm. So if you have the fibula reduced, I don't have a problem with using an intramedullary device to stabilize. And by and reducing and stabilizing the posterior mal, like you said, that's your method of reduction of your fibula. And, and that's kind of a theme, I think, through your cases is, um, is which bone do you, is simpler, and which one do you use to reduce the other? And this is kind of a wrinkle, an additional wrinkle in that part of this is the posterior mal. And, um, and I'd have to say, you know, I, in principle, I agree this one was really small, um, but after the British study a year and a half ago where even some of the really small ones, the impact it had on the tib fib joint and the syndesmosis, I've I've been a little more liberal with CTs and and gone after them a little bit more. And not that this one needed it, but I just throw that out because the you know even the slight mal reductions with small um, uh, posterior mal's was kind of impressive in that series. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, I think. I think we are a lot more aggressive with CTs of, of ankle fractures now. Uh, some of my, uh, uh, well, I guess some people consider me senior faculty, but there are more senior faculty uh, at my institution who question my wanting to get a CT scan on just about every single ankle fracture. And I disagree with them immensely. Uh, I think now that we know more about the syndesmosis, more about the posterior mal, more about the need to reduce the syndesmosis properly. Uh, I'm CT scanning a lot more ankle fractures than I have in the past. Mm -hmm. so 
because you need to know the relationships. And I have some more examples later on that will show some of these relationships uh, prior to uh, undertaking uh, you know, your surgical plan. And, and I just wanted to make one more point logistically. When you did this surgery, you were supine with a lateral approach, um, you know, plus or minus direct visualization of the syndesmosis. If you were to fix the posterior mal, um, your ability to do a direct reduction if you wanted to of the syndesmosis is hampered because you're posterior. Um, Correct. Even uh, more rely. And just, just sort of pointing that out, you kind of, if you choose one position over the other, you, you're losing an option. Yeah, that, 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 that is a, that's a huge point. I mean, in the past, I've done a lot of my syndesmotic reductions open under direct visualization, but ever since I've become a lot more aggressive with fixing the posterior malila injury, uh, I'm doing a lot more ankles prone. And mm -hmm. that, that totally takes away your ability uh, to look at the syndesmosis from the front. Mm -hmm. And you are taking a leap of faith that if your posterior amount is perfectly reduced, uh, that your syndesmosis will be reduced by virtue of the fact that the PITFL is attached. Yep. Uh, having said that, there's been a few cases where I've started off prone to fix the posterior amount, was not happy with the syndesmotic reduction up front and had to flip the patient over, reprep and redrape and flip the patient over. It makes for a longer day, uh, but the rewards are, 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 are clearly there. Uh, don't want to do that all the time, but there are times in which you do have to do that. The times in which you really have to do that is if the injury gets out past three or four weeks. Uh, so even if you reduce the posterior amount perfectly, there's still uh, what I call junk <laughs> in the mm -hmm. tip of joint. So you need to flip the patient supine and debride that to get a reduction of the syndesmosis. Uh, Jack, just not to belabor the point, I know we have uh, a lot more cases. Um, how do you, one, one, one last question I'll pose to both of you. Um, how do you, and what is your way of actually doing a open, because there was a question asking about how do you assess reduction, number one, and how do you, if you're going to open it, how are you opening it to reduce it? That's in this message. Sorry. Uh, yeah, for, for me, uh, to do an open reduction of the syndesmosis, I do it from the front. And it's just an extension of your approach to the fibula. And I bring my, I, I dissect anteriorly right over the, the syndesmosis joint. Uh, most of the time, I'll, I'll uh, externally rotate the fibula so I can see into the joint, uh, take a freer or, or a pituitary rangeur and clean out the joint. Usually there's scar tissue in there. Probably you can see remnants of the AITF on there that needs to be breeded. And then I put it back into the focus under direct vision. I will admit that even when doing that, you can still now reduce the osmosis because the reads are simply not that great. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, uh, we also know that there's at least nine different morphologies of the syndesmosis joint. Uh, that's been described. And so depending upon the actual patient's morphology, uh, opening it may or may not help you that much with reduction, but at least for me, it makes me feel better. And I do a, a separate incision and look at the joint. The a separate, joint. Yeah, a separate yeah. uh, like an anterior lateral, you mean? Or is, or is it just an, an extension of what Jack was saying? Um, different, separate incision. So, and in, in usually, you know, it, it doesn't have a big bridge, but it's usually small, mm -hmm. you know, centimeter, centimeter and a half, um, and, and almost distal to the fibular incision, but mm -hmm. just right over the, you know, if you look at his x-ray there, right over the, um, the lateral talus. So you're looking at the articular cartilage in the oh, tip of Okay, so you're 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 looking at the confluence at the ankle joint, correct? At the joint, yep. Not yeah. at the syndesmosis. Yep. Not at the syndesmosis. Okay, so you're 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 looking at that confluence of the tibia, talus, and fibula. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Good. Cool. All right. We can keep moving. Okay. Case number two. 
Oh. I mean, you can talk about this for like, you know, four hours. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here's another case, a uh, similar case, 25 year old gentleman skateboarding has this particular injury, uh, comes to the ED, clothes reduction, uh, casting, and then sent out and brought back in for surgery. And so my questions with this case is, how should we approach this case? Uh, should we do a standard RF just like we did in the last case, fix the lateral mal and then, and then reduce the stabilize the medial mal? Or should we do something different? And I'll just go back to the x-rays. So I use this case as a good example of why you sort of need to take a look at your x-rays and, and think a little more in depth regarding your preoperative plan. Uh, I think most surgeons would, by knee-jerk response, will say, all right, let's just, yeah, we'll just take the patient to the OR, let's reduce and stabilize the fibula, and then we could clearly reduce and stabilize that medial mal and be done with it. And then test the syndesmosis and syndesmox stabilization if needed. Uh, so this, this case I, I use as a good example because if you actually look at these, this x-ray, and if you go with that plan, my question is, how are you gonna reduce and stabilize the fibula with an emphasis on the word reduction? It's an extremely comminuted fibula. Uh, you're you're gonna have very little reads in, in regards to length, alignment and rotation, which is what is needed, right? Uh, as with, all, with all, all fracture stabilizations, you wanna get length, alignment and rotation correct. And if you look at the, the amount of comminution of that fibula, that's gonna be an extremely difficult task. And so I ask uh, the audience to actually think about this. Is there another way of approaching this uh, that would help you? And so for me in this particular, when, when I'm faced with a very common new fibula, which is common in these uh, supination deduction injuries, I actually approach the medial now first. And if you look here, this is an intraop x-ray showing the medial mal reduced, but if you look over at the fibula, the simple act of reducing the medial mal, a ligament of taxis, uh, because the lateral ligaments here are intact, you've already achieved reduction with respect to length at least. Uh, you don't have alignment yet, and, but it probably has at least pretty close to the correct rotation of the fibula. And so I use this as an example of by doing a direct reduction first of the medial mal, this affords you with a indirect reduction of the lateral mal. And so it makes your day a lot easier. You can go ahead and reduce and stabilize your medial mal first, and then you could fine tune your reduction of your fibula, taking advantage of the ligament taxes to help you restore length uh, using an implant to restore alignment and rotation. Uh, in this particular case, we use a little push-pull screw up the top uh, to help just adjust the length a little bit more. Uh, and then bridge plate will apply an implant in the bridging function of the fibula. In this particular case, the syndesmosis was, was not intact. There was no poster mal fracture. So this, fracture, this, this case got stabilized with a uh, syndesmotic uh, stabilization. And you can use whatever syndesmotic stabilization of choice uh, that you want. So what other, let's see, we can open this up for a discussion. Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Um, I know we're gonna get to the first part of this, some up with another case that you have, but um, I think uh, Jan was uh, talking about, uh, I think he's used, um, I think he's talking about CT scan after um, reduction in synosmosis, um, but also maybe a role for arthroscopy. And then uh, Dr. Stahl was talk talking about using the quote, Mueller nose trick to assess for adequate fibula length and restoration. So like your tricks to make sure that you actually have correct a length line rotation of the fibula. Yeah, that, 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 that's, uh, that's, those are good points. Uh, at, at my institution, we have not gone into a routine of CT scanning every single ankle fracture post-op. Uh, 
I think that would lead to a revolt by the radiology department if we started doing that. Uh, we tend to CT scan those that we have some doubts about, uh, but we don't, we are not at the stage of routinely CT scanning every single uh, syndesmotic injury. Uh, having said that, uh, I actually like the idea of CT scanning uh, just to check your reduction. Uh, but yeah, you know, at my institution, we have not gotten to that. Uh, it's like, curious as to what, what other people are doing. Are they CTing every single pulse up ankle or, or not? I'm not either. I think, I yeah. think, you know, with you, I'm um, doing much more open reduction of the synosmosis, um, but I'm not CTing everyone. Um, and I think the question had come up to, um, you know, I, both of these you used a rigid a screw and, um, you know, what's the role of a, of a more flexible fixation and, you know, does that impact whether you CT or not? Because I think, you know, I use a lot more screws like you've shown and I plan to take them out um, at a certain time. So Carla, uh, to your point, uh, there was a question on the Q&A that actually is, when do you take out the screw? And what do you do when the syndesmosis opens up a few millimeters when the screw comes out or it breaks? Jack or Carl, you can. Oh, I, I can comment. I, I actually take a different tack. I tell patients, uh, I'm gonna, I may need to place a screw across your distal joint. Uh, I do not routinely remove that screw. That screw may or may not break, uh, but I don't routinely remove the screws. Uh, when I do use screws, and I, I've gone on to using a lot more flexible fixation as well. Uh, but when I do use a screw, I use a, a, a 4 0 cortex screw with a 3 5 head uh, so that it's not prominent. Uh, my reason, my rationale for not removing screws is I actually don't know when a synosmosis is healed. I mean, I, I think we should remove synosmotic screws when the synosmosis is healed. The problem is I don't know when the synosmosis is healed. There is a bell curve, right? Some people heal a lot faster than other people. And so how do you tell when it is time to remove a synosmotic screw? I don't know. I don't know where people get 12 weeks from or six weeks or three months or six months. It seems like numbers thrown out of the ear. Uh, and so I tend to just leave them in. Uh, I tell the patient it might break, it may not break. Uh, and that's sort of how I approach, when I use rigid fixation, that's how I approach that. And I think with response Other to the comment, yeah, with response to Michael's yeah. question, it, it depends on when, you know, if it's two weeks post-op and your screw breaks or backs out, there's no chance the syndesmosis is healed. And, and I think if you, if you ask any patient while the screw's intact, their mobility is, is reduced, right? But once it's healed at four months, five months, six months, if it breaks that, that little bit of, you know, physiologic relaxation of the joint, they appreciate that. They, they um, you know, they'll tell you the ankle biomechanics are, are better. And, and, you know, the literature would say that if your screw breaks, you sort of restore the, the, um, motion, which is kind of, I think, part of the argument for the flexible fixation. But I think it, it really matters if, if it breaks or backs out before it's healed versus after it's healed. Um, I, would, I would leave it after it's healed, but if it's early, I would worry, you know, a, um, a syndesmotic deficient ankle is a problem in a young person. So I'd redo it if it, if it depending, although you'll see it in a case where I didn't, but, um, Normally, I'd redo it if it's early. Yeah, I think for for these for these, and you bring out very valid points uh, regarding the ankle biomechanics not wanting to have a uh, stabilization. 
And for that reason, I, I'm a relatively late adopter, but I've gone on to much more use of flexible fixation for my mm -hmm. uh, These cases are a little bit uh, older by a couple of years. Uh, but yeah, lately I've gone on to a lot more flexible fixation. That's why I don't, I don't even have to think about removing it. Uh, but back in the days when I did use solid fixation, uh, my, my query, my question has always been, well, we should remove the synthmark screws when the synthmosis is healed. Tell me when it's healed. I don't know. So his, uh, his, uh, his fall up was uh, more of a chronic thing. If it opens up like at six months or something like that, and then it becomes white. Um, yeah. Yeah, if the problem with that is at six months, if you take out a synthmark screw and the synthmosis opens up, what do you do? Do you replace the screw? Because at that point in time, is there any more healing potential of your synthmosis? So are you gonna leave that screw in forever? Uh, you need to do something to get the synthmosis to heal if you're gonna restabilize the synthmosis at six months. Yeah. What are you gonna to do to make that synthmosis heal? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer to that, but that that's always the dilemma. Yeah, yeah something needs to be done for sure. Yeah. Um, so we have a uh, we have eleven minutes. So um, I know we have more cases. So if uh, Jack, you want to keep going, or if Carla wants to, so, put up yeah, more cases, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Time. Do you want to do one more, and then I'll. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is another. This is an example of a very common injury. Uh, what some people refer to as a Maisonneuve injury. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that terminology is proper, but basically it's a pronation external rotation injury where the injury occurs all the way across the symphosis, all the way up to the mid shaft or even higher uh, to the fibula and then exits out the fibula. So the injury is actually uh, the fibula fracture, the entire symptomatic membrane, and the AITFL, probably the PITFL although not always, uh, in these injuries. And so this is a very common injury. And I see it uh, in my practice commonly addressed uh, a particular way that I don't necessarily agree with. So I bring this up for example. And here's a, you know, an example of how far the ankle opens. The reason why I say a lot of times you can't tell the PITF is involved is because this is actually uh, an external rotation deformity of the fibula. And if the PITFL is intact, it's simply an external rotation on the PITFL ligament. So based on these x-rays, you can't tell the PITFL is involved or not involved. But for sure, we know the AITFL is involved, the Sims-Mark membrane is involved, and of course, the pressure exits out the fibula. And so the question is, how do you want to reduce and stabilize this particular injury? And what most surgeons typically do is they go to their hospital and they find the biggest king tongue in the world they can find. And they place one tongue on the fibula, one tongue on the uh, medial tibia, and they squeeze as hard as they can, you know, until the tongue is about to break. And then they place the sinus mark screw, uh, they perform sinus mark stabilization. And my question to those, uh, to those, Practitioners is how do you know the synthesis is reduced when you do that? And this leads to a discussion of what is meant by reduced synthesis. And for me, the definition of reduced synthesis is the fibula is correct with respect to length, alignment, and rotation. And so for me, the only way to assure that is actually to reduce the fibula. There apparently is an old wives tale running around that, that says that if the fibula fracture is more than halfway up the fibula, up the tibia, that there's no need to reduce and stabilize the fibula. And I, I tend to disagree with that. Uh, number one, because I don't really know what halfway up means. Doesn't mean if the fracture is here, you don't fix it, but if the fracture is there, you do fix it by a couple of millimeters. Uh, so to me, uh, my adage is the only way I know that that fibula is correctly reduced is to reduce the fibula. And a lot of times once you do that, the fibula generally just falls right back into the side, into its correct place in the synthesis. And all you need to do is perform some type of synthesis stabilization. And once again, 
if I was doing this case today, I'd probably perform a flexible fixation. But this is, uh, once again, an older case, 2018. So uh, I'll open this up for discussion. Any discussions? Let's see. Ryan Will says, these cases need to reduce proximally. Yeah, that, that was sort of my point. Uh, so I agree with you, Jackson. This is sort of a, not really a mason but it's a tweener. If it's a fibular neck, I wouldn't fix it, but I, I think you're absolutely right with this. Did you also open the syndesmosis distally? You know, I don't recall if I did or didn't. Uh, I know most of the time I do, so I would just simply say I probably did. So even though you anatomically reduce the fibula, you're still opening to look at the syndesmosis. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I don't, uh, Harmeet will tell you at my institution, we don't have the luxury of doing these cases injury day one or two. Uh, these patients get sent home and they get brought back and this is now injury day three weeks by the time we get to these cases. And so a lot of times at three weeks, there's scar tissue that forms uh, that, that blocks your syndesmic reduction. I'm sure if you did this on injury day one and you reduce the fibula, that fibula will fall right back into its proper position mm -hmm. uh, because of the unique nature of my uh, situation. A lot of times we get to these cases a lot later. And by that time, I find a lot of times, uh, you know, something falls into that uh, to fib joint, either the torn a AITFL remnant will be in there or scar tissue in there. So to me, there's some need to perform some type of debridement uh, of that of that joint before it actually finally reduces into its proper position. And, and I think I've found that, you know, right or wrong, even, even on day, post-injury day one, the ability to malreduce with your hardware is pretty significant, especially with kind of a flat uh, syndesmotic joint. So I feel like if I'm pinning it closed before I put a screw, I'm not quite sure what impact. Whereas if I open it and I, I sort of look at the joint, pin it there, then I, right or wrong, I may be wrong, I think that I can um, maintain that reduction better as I place the hardware. Um, that's sort of been, you know, my thinking as I've gotten more aggressive with looking at it. Yeah, yeah I just thought it was a comment from our fearless leader saying that he still would not open this. Yep. One. With the rest of the one that's that was right one. between, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, my, my, yeah my, my problem is I don't know how you get the length correct without actually reducing the fibula. So uh, well, there is a need to get the length correct. Yeah, definitely. Oh, my, 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 argument, my argument would be that you certainly can anatomically reduce this and it increases the likelihood you're going to get it right distally. But if you get it anatomic proximally and still malreduce the syndesmosis, you still haven't helped them. Agreed. Agreed. 